Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Greg Carr, and this is our weekly hour devoted to exploring ideas and subjects of special importance to African people and others working and fighting to build a better society. You might have noticed that normally I would have on a dashiki, a little bit formal, formal, formal dress, but my mom is from Russell County, Alabama, just outside Phoenix City. And I've always had a special place in my heart for Tuskegee University, where as a little girl in the 1940s, she ran track on some of those fields at Tuskegee. Um, today, we are deeply, deeply honored to have uh, a brother who has written about that institution, its place in the imaginary of African people in the United States and beyond, its place in the history of the last century and a quarter, almost century and a half, and in many ways, its meaning and its centrality to the quest to questions of education and social, and social change. Uh, that man is no other than Dr. Brian P. Jones. Uh, Brian Jones is the inaugural director of the Center for Educators and Schools at the New York Public Library. Before that, he was a scholar in residence and associate director for education at the Schomburg Center legendary Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. He comes out of education at every level. He spent almost a decade as a public school teacher in the city, working in elementary school primarily, and carried that momentum into a run for public office while he was in graduate school. No small feat. The Green Party candidate for lieutenant governor of the state of New York. And he, uh, we're going to have to have him back to discuss this whole range of debate around charter schools and public schools, but all of that passion, all of that energy has been emptied into his work, whether it be in, an, in anthologies like Black Lives Matter at School, uh, his work with the Howard Zinn Project, his work with uh, any number of public education and social change transformation formations, and his work in particular today that he poured into the Tuskegee Student Uprising, a history. Dr. Brian Jones. Brian, it's good to have you here, brother. Wow, thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, and it's really an honor to be on this show. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of this show, and so it's, I'm thrilled to be in this hot seat. 
oh no, this seat. Look, the seat is definitely gonna be hot. <laughs> All those who oppose our common humanity, but where we are right now is dead cool, brother. <laughs> Here I was down in Vodun, I do have on a hot color in red, but it's it's the Golden Eagle. So I, I hope you'll forgive me, man. Let's let's just jump right into it. I um I couldn't put this book down. First of all, thank you for sending it to me. And uh, and and I appreciate the fact that you told us before we start taping, and I hope you'll relate to everyone watching how you came to do that. And you know, particularly as somebody who's a grandson of Alabama, and I hope one day to go down there and perhaps even set up shop and work for a while. Mm. Line for line, this work and what Tuskegee meant and means. I mean, it's just nothing short of transformative. Could you could you give us a sense, particularly since as I read through and you said your father went to Tuskegee, I think it was 57 to 61 or two. Tell, That's tell right, me, yeah. But how did you come to write this book? Well, <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, I, I didn't, the story doesn't start with my father, but it loops back to him um, because it was really when I was working in Harlem as an elementary school teacher, um, in the early part of this century, in the first decade uh, and a half of this century. And I was experiencing Harlem as the epicenter, it felt like, of a movement to privatized public education. And so it felt like the rug was being pulled out from under us, teachers like me and my colleagues, many of whom teaching in Harlem were black, were, seemed to be um, positioned as the problem, as enemies of learning and um, success in the schools. And I was curious about the way in which very, very wealthy people seem to focus on, at least rhetorically, the fate of black students. And I thought that's really what is going on here. I mean, something wild is going on here. And because I've always been interested in black history and you know, black history has been a touchstone for me, I never pursued deeply though black education history. And, and so I started reading and trying to understand it better to see how we got to where I was. What was the story building up to that? And it's that story that led me to Tuskegee as the foundation stone of a hope that similar kind of people, elites, white people, after the, after the overthrow of radical reconstruction, um, it seemed like they had high hopes that they could create a model of education for black people in the South as a means of social control. And um, I think what the Tuskegee student uprising shows, uh, or the story that I ended up finding, is that you can design whatever you want for people, <laughs> but once people gather in a place, they bring their own ideas to it. Um, and education is a thing that's hard to contain, actually. Uh, because once you can read, you can read anything. Once you can write, you can write anything. Yes. Um, so that's when, you know, once I started fixating on Tuskegee and Booker T. Washington, that's when I went to my dad, uh, who went there. And, you know, he is um, the type who loves this sort of thing, loves to dig into the history in the past and learn more. And he's really a curious person. So he suggested that we drive there together. Neither wow. of us had done any archival research before. This was, you know, I was trying, I was trying to get a PhD in education. I wasn't thinking of myself as a historian. I was going to say, uh, I mean, if memory serves me correctly, although you were at Cooney, I, I'm assuming uh, Manny Marable was not yet taking the turn. He was still kind of around because you talk about him being in Tuskegee and then, you know, obviously, but, but this sounds like as much of a rite of passage as I was reading it, I could imagine being in that car. I wish I could have taken a trip like that with my pop, man. What was that like? I mean, it was amazing. It was, um, it was amazing. And, you know, of course I, I have the, the recorder going. So my first interview is this long car ride interview with him. This is and the one he's laying. Like, you don't say in the car, but I did see that you, <laughs> that's the car interview. Yeah. Yeah. It's the car interview. It's a long interview. And it's like, suddenly I, I, I'd never heard these stories before. Suddenly I'm hearing, and we'd never gone deep about Tuskegee. So suddenly I'm hearing all this stuff about what it was like. And, you know, of course, when you do research, 
uh, you know, if you if you're doing it right, it's full of surprises. Like you, you're not you're not going to find what you expect to find. That's so, you know, lots of things. Um, the, the first thing you learn is how much you don't know. And I started realizing there was this whole big story about the faculty. I knew nothing about all this activism that the faculty had done. Um, and but the reason we were going together really was that I had seen in the literature these mentions, and I didn't see a book anywhere that anybody had written, but I'd seen these mentions that students had protested in the earliest years of the school um, in 1896 and 1905. Um, and I thought, oh my God, that's why Booker T. Washington was there. And, you know, sometimes I see, as I'm trying to understand the relationship between people like Booker T. Washington and Du Bois, I see people dismissing Du Bois' criticisms. Um, and, you know, understandably, because uh, Booker T. Washington was born in slavery. You know, yeah. he's Absolutely. that's a different thing than being born in Massachusetts. You oh, know, no Du Bois went to Harvard. That's right. Um, <laughs> this is a different. And so that's understandable. But the students are different though. The students were, were not from Massachusetts. The students in 1896 are from Alabama and Louisiana. Like they're, they're part of that movement out of slavery uh, with Booker T. Washington. So I, I thought, oh, this shows the campus as a contested space yes. from the beginning. It's not just the genius of the founder. It's that actually other people showed up to realize their dream. That's right. And and that those dreams were part of this long black freedom movement that so often has been focused on learning, on literacy and learning for liberation. Uh, I love and so, way, go ahead. No, I love the way that you, throughout the book, pay homage to the generations of intellectual workers who have preceded us. I mean, I know every fall in my Education in Black America class, I teach James Anderson's book, The Education of Blacks in the South. And you bring that to the table. You put it right up front. And like you said, these students show up. I remember there was one, remember that story when they were at Hampton and, and, the, and the brother writes home and said, I came here to learn math and science. They got me painting fence posts and out here digging in the field. I mean, as you say, this un, the, the story of Tuskegee in the 60s is preceded by all these black college rebellions that are student led. It was really fascinating to see. And even, and you even brought up an old chestnut, although I did not know he turned, he, he did this racist turn later in life. Ray Walter's book, The New Negro yeah. on Campus. Could you talk a little about that genealogy? And we'll probably pick this up in the, in the next block, but uh, this genealogy of student movements that began, as you say, right, almost coterminous with the beginning of these institutions. Yeah. And, and I think, I hope uh, black, uh, historically black colleges are starting to, if they, don't already recognize that although it can be awkward to embrace these critics, you know, these are students who are raising criticisms of, of, of the school, um, but in the long view, look at them as this vanguard that was ever showing higher education its future. Mm -hmm. They were always pushing forward and with their demands that were intolerable in pick the year, flash forward a decade, and that was policy. Wow. They were at the forefront of democratizing the, the higher education, of expanding the curriculum. They were pushing and pushing and pushing. And sometimes it's more about their individual career aspirations, and sometimes it's more about the politics, um, refusing Jim Crow on campus, uh, and that sort of thing. I mean, refusing whatever accommodations the leadership had made to allow the school to exist. So they were always pushing, pushing, pushing. And I think if you look at them in the long view, you see that they have had an amazing effect on higher education in this country, not just at historically black colleges, but really at all of higher education. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, that's, that's a good place for us to pause uh, for a moment. And when we come back, we're going to pick this right up. Uh, what you heard is really uh, a lead in into how Brian Jones takes us into this history, not only Tuskegee, but education in this country and beyond. So when we come back, we will continue with our guest, Dr. Brian Jones, and his book, The Tuskegee Student Uprising, here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. I'm 
Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. And we are talking today with Dr. Brian P. Jones of the New York Public Library, uh, educator, activist, um, engaged intellectual who has traced and tracked the story of struggle on the campus of Tuskegee University and beyond in the Tuskegee student uprising. Uh, Brian, when we left, as you were laying this out, I love the way you phrased that, that. What looks like real radical struggle or pushback in one generation in the next generation becomes policy. In your first chapter, where you kind of trace this using Tuskegee as a case study, I, it is one of the most, as far as I'm concerned, clear, concise, and brilliant expositions of how that generation moves uh, that I've ever read. Um, you, 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 you don't beat up Booker T. Washington, but you don't shy away from the criticisms either. And in one chapter, man, for you to take all these people, Booker T. Washington, I mean, every law student learns Chameleon versus Lightfoot, but you bring... Dr. Gamillion to life. And you talk about how this black middle class emerges out of Tuskegee, surrounded in Jim Crow. And it's so funny, I was reading the other day Jesse Guzman's book, Crusade Pacific Democracy, because of course I knew her because of Monroe work. But you take us from generation to generation to generation. Could you talk about what, how does Tuskegee represent these tensions that are probably all black colleges in the South, is each generation makes a struggle and these tensions kind of emerge. Yeah, th thank you for that generous interpretation of the chapter. Uh, it, it was uh, one of my professors who suggested that I'm going to probably have to write that I'm going to probably have to have to write a history of Tuskegee to in order to make the 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 chapters about the '60s really land. And you know, as I said, I went there seeking a story about the late 19th century, early 20th century, and it was the archivists there who you know, seeing my frustration, because there wasn't that much, uh, in true, you know, thank God for the, uh, for the librarians and archivists who basically make these books possible by uh, showing you what's what. Um, but they brought out the student newspaper and showed me this explosive struggle in the 1960s. And um, it was through, you know, what I saw there in the student newspaper from the 60s, but also the interviews, the way that people who had attended the school or had worked there. I spoke to 21 former Tuskegee community members um, and they all unprompted emphasized this thing about the class nature of the place. I wasn't able to pin down a definitive demographic comparison, but it seems to me that Tuskegee might have been the largest concentration of professional black folks anywhere in the country in the middle of the 20th century. More than 2,000 people, like per square foot, more than 2,000 people in this tiny town. So you not only do you have the professors, but you also have the nurses and doctors at two different hospitals. And then don't forget about the Tuskegee Airmen. So you have the pilots, you have pilot trainers, you have the engineers. So there's this enormous class of people with advanced degrees who are not allowed to vote. Um, and one guy jokes that, you know, they're making him jump through so many hoops to fill out a voter application. He's like, I sat for my, uh, I sat longer for this uh, voting application than I had to sit for my German oral exams, you know? <laughs> like that's who's there. And there's, they have all private automobiles and backyards and they send, some of them send their kids to New England boarding schools and they take European vacations. And, you know, it's like, that's a, particular class of people. Now we see that around, you know, that that kind of a class of people can accumulate around other HBCUs and do in the 20th century. Sure. But what's unique about Tuskegee is that this class of people is in the deep south. This is in the black belt. This is in the middle of the black belt in rural Alabama. Absolutely. So I mean, it's different. Let me just right, right quick inject, and you're teaching all the way. I mean, having spent time at Schomburg and now at NYPL, and I appreciate the fact that you raised this question of primary sources and interviews. Young people, particularly if you're watching this, listen very closely to what Dr. Jones is saying, because if you've got elders in your family, 
you know, my mother who went to one of Rosenwald schools, didn't finish uh, junior high school. She knew some of them because they were in that community. So if you're in Jackson, Mississippi or Grambling, Louisiana, if you're in Nashville, Tennessee, if there are elders in your community, you need to sit with them because, Brian, I'm, I don't think a lot of this history is being captured. And what you give us in this book, in addition to all the information, is a roadmap for how we can begin to, to reconstruct. And you did talk to some of these folks, huh? I mean, we both well, know I, uh, the, the great uh, Chester Higgins. He put the book in your hand, brother. This is, blew my <laughs> mind when you told that story. Could you tell us some of these people you interviewed, man, what, what it meant? Oh, man, it was amazing. I mean, that's part of the joy of research is, is gathering these stories. But um, one of my professors early on was trying to teach me something that it was it's very hard to learn, which is how to listen. Uh, it's very hard to listen because you come with an agenda and you have all these ideas. Um, but as she schooled me, you know, the person you're interviewing, they have an agenda too. And mm -hmm. if you're willing to kind of whew, take a deep breath and not speak and let them carry out their agenda, you'll actually learn things. And it's very hard to do. And I don't know that I always did it well, but I learned so much uh, and keep learning when I go back to those interviews. But as you mentioned, Chester Higgins was one of the first uh, because he lives in New York, world famous photographer, um, you know, award winning photographer of the African diaspora. If you just Google him, he has so many books. His newest book, Sacred Nile, is about the origins of Judeo Christian and other religious traditions on the Nile River. In other words, the role of African societies in the origins of the world's major religions. Um, and he has exhibits up all over the place. He's just an amazing photographer. So, of course, I asked him, you know, do you have photographs of the struggle in the 60s? Um, and he said, well, I have one. <laughs> and because uh, he was just learning to take pictures in 1968. But I'm in his home and he hands me one. And it's gorgeous. I, I mean, it's stunning photograph. And he hands it to me and he nods kind of knowingly. And he says, well, you know, that's your cover. <laughs> and sure and sure enough, that is the cover of the book. It's the one photograph that Chester Higgins took. Um, but so he he was just an amazing person. Another person I interviewed was Gwen Patton, um, who you know I interviewed her in her kitchen in Montgomery, Alabama. She asked me to bring her lunch, uh, so I did. I took her protocol. lunch order. Don't you love the protocol? <laughs> 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 yeah. That was your first pass, honey. You must have passed before I asked of course, the legendary Gwen Patton, student body president, student body body coordinating committee. So it begins with the lunch order. <laughs> yeah, the lunch order. That and, you know, of course, so I go to the restaurant. They didn't have what she asked for. So then I had to call her up again, explain that. So then I'm talking her through the menu. Finally, I get a lunch order. I bring it to her home. And she didn't touch a bit of it. She didn't touch it. She opened it up, didn't touch it. She's chain smoking and talking. And she's, you know, just so, she's a very diminutive person, but just so powerful, such a powerful personality. And um, she, at one point, steps into, she says, oh, I want to get you something. She steps out of her kitchen into a, a side room. And time goes by and time goes by. And I'm wondering where, where she's gone. So I peek my head over and she's in her study. And the light is hitting her just so. But the wall next to her is just floor to ceiling, half a century of plaques and commendations and photographs and buttons and placards and like half a century of activism. Uh, I mean, just an incredible display. And I asked her, like, could I take your picture right now? And she said, sure, go ahead. So I snapped a cell phone photo. And that photo is in the back of the book because a few years later, of course, uh, Gwen passed, unfortunately, and um, and I just felt like, oh, my God, I feel so lucky that I got a chance to talk to her um, and interview her really twice um, before uh, before that. I do want to say one thing about Please. Gwen, Gwen Patton, um, yeah. which is that and, and I hear you speaking to your listeners and viewers who are interested in black history. I hope somebody out there listening will take up the challenge to write a book about her. Uh, because she is quoted widely. She has a real literary legacy. She's one of the Tuskegee student activists who wrote the most. So you can find her in The Liberator. You can find her in Freedom Ways. You can find her all over the place. But I think she deserves her own study. And she has an archive at Trenholm State Technical College that she walked me through. And it's amazing. Yeah, um, and 
if you don't mind us mentioning that, and by the way, everybody needs to get this book. That's I, I'm looking at this picture now. You told me the backstory on page 176, photo by Brian Jones, where it came from. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Gwen, Gwen Patton, man, um, I remember her saying something years ago. She's being interviewed, and she talked about, you know, obviously, as you know, and as folks now will learn, the first person to start an archive at a community college. And, and she had to press the president for it. And of course, that school in Alabama, named for Council Trenum, American Teachers Association, the Association of Colored Schools, the generation in that 19th century, those black educators, when asked, mm. why don't you put it at Auburn or Alabama State? She said, no, because the students who go to this community college are the direct heirs of the students who engaged in this struggle. And for me, that was so important to hear her say that because the politics of archives, as you know better than any of us, and certainly having worked at the, probably the premier archive in the diaspora, the Schomburg Center, which of course black folk in the community struggle to make sure continues in a way that it does. You know, how important is it when we are doing these stories to be engaged in the work that the people who did this work that we're now going back and writing about and studying about are engaged in? I mean, I worry sometimes that some of the folks writing about this stuff aren't engaged in the struggle, but Gwen Patton is an excellent example of somebody who made a living tradition stand up by making deliberate choices as, as an archivist. And I don't think either one of y'all were trained as an archivist, but both of y'all end up in archives. Which is- <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, she, she really is giving us a gift by collecting uh, in the way that she did. And, and to your point about elders in your life and their connection to these stories, when Gwen Patton's a memoir was published posthumously. I was flipping through it and saw a photograph of her as a cheerleader at Inkster High uh, in Detroit area, Michigan. And I thought, and then the woman and the young woman next to her in a cheerleader uniform, I, I was sure was my mother. So I sent my mom that photograph and called her up and she said, Brian, that's not me. She what? said, she said, that's my sister. Stop. Playing. That's your auntie. That's my auntie. <laughs> so I called up my aunt Vivian and she said, ooh, Gwen Patton, that little fire stick. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you that story? Man, isn't that something that's living tradition? You know what? Let, let's pause here for a minute, Brian. When we come back, please, we're going to pick up here because you've introduced us to these major figures and you trace them back to when they are teenagers. And, and, and whether it be, you know, Sam Youngie or James Foreman, I mean, so many others. You know, you, you lead us into how they wage the struggle at Tuskegee, and, and we are certainly the beneficiaries of the struggle. So we'll be back in a minute with Brian Jones, the author of the Tuskegee stuff, uh, the Tuskegee Student Uprising. Back in a moment here at the Black Table. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm Greg Carr, your regular host. Pleased to be joined today by Brian Jones, author of the Tuskegee Student Uprising. Y'all remember to support the Black Star Network because of conversations like this, you're not going to see anywhere else in this form. Brian, you walked us right into it, man. I um, was really touched and moved to see how you, after having narrated the history of Tuskegee and these tensions and these struggles, uh, you bring us into the 1960s. Uh, an era that you say in your interview with your father, you say, well, I don't remember this. I went to one protest early on, but that chapter where, well, chapter two and then three, where you walk us through these student activists and what they want and how they inherit that struggle from the previous generation of faculty and others and those tensions and those convergences. Tell us about that struggle and, and how, how these young people like Gwen Patton and others come into that space at Tuskegee in 1960, 61, 62. And everybody from Malcolm X to Stokely Carmichael to the original Black Panther Party. I mean, it's like, where, where has this story been? Tell us some <laughs> context. Man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the tentacles are everywhere. And I think partially the, ge- the geography of it, being in the middle of the Black Belt, literally, meant that as the movement is picking up, the Southern movement for freedom and democracy uh, is picking up. Tuskegee is a logical way station. It is 
a center of that movement, a place to rest and get resources to gather and think uh, and then go out. But um, picking up on something you gestured to earlier, I just want to acknowledge that, uh, as I do in the book, that there's a way in which the faculty and administrators, to their credit, open the door to the student movement. One of those ways is that um, the dean of students uh, actually created a program, a tutoring program, a literacy program in those rural counties, in the surrounding rural counties. Mm -hmm. um, and so that meant they were sending Tuskegee students out into the rural counties to kind of, you know, improve uh, literacy um, to their rural cousins. But they started to do that in the mid 1960s, right at the moment when those folks were not greeting them meekly. Those folks were rising up. So you're encountering rural people at a moment when you see them and encounter them as powerful people, as people who are standing up for themselves, as brave people, as courageous people. Suddenly the students are meeting these folks whose lifestyle is very different from theirs, very rural, but they're seeing them lose family members. People in their family disappear. They're seeing the courage uh, of, of folks in the, in the Black Belt counties and they're inspired by that. So in the first instance, it's this contact with the broader movement and frankly, the struggle for democracy. You know, the first Black Panther Party is the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. Tuskegee students are there. Wow, and they bring that back on. It really is fascinating, Brian, again, we, this is really, we need a much longer conversation about this because as you're talking, I'm thinking about how Tuskegee's always done that outreach. You know, I mean, but this is a very different circumstance than George Carver going out there with his uh, his agricultural wagons to help farmers. But now they're going out and coming back radicalized. I mean, the class tensions, how does that put strains on the relationship these students have with their faculty and with folks, as you say, like Dean, uh, Dean Phillips, Phillips. Who's trying to help them, right? I mean, yeah. how, how does that put on the tensions? And then how does that empty into their push to create, which in many ways for me is the heart of this moment, it still has its reverberations, the black university. You said, well, isn't Tuskegee a black university? It's like, oh, no, no, <laughs> right. you're talking right. about it. So <laughs> tell us about that. Right. Well, some of the tensions, there are many ways the tensions emerge. One of them is um, when one of the student activists, Sammy Young Jr., a uh, Navy veteran and Tuskegee student, is in, in active, very active with SNCC, and in, he's in Lowndes County, he's talking to Stokely Carmichael. Uh, he's murdered at the very first week of 1966 in an off-campus incident involving a segregated gas station bathroom just off campus. Um, murdered by a white, an older white gas station attendant, basically. And it's not just his murder, but the fact that his murder is acquitted very quickly by an Alabama jury a year later, and also the reaction of the administration, which is very, uh, you know, it's part of its strategy for surviving all these years has been to be in a certain accommodation um, with the white power structure in town. And of course, as we said, they push back in certain ways, but they also accommodate in other ways. Um, and so while they had encouraged uh, student activists for, for quite a while and had been supportive and qu quietly behind the scenes defending them when they were under attack in ways the students didn't even know about, while all of that was going on, the students began to perceive that the changes that were happening in the world and in the nation suddenly made all of these accommodations feel thoroughly outdated. And even the the victory, the voting rights victory of the faculty, all of this was like, well, yes, of course. So then the students were had a candidate for sheriff, uh, sheriff uh, black. They thought we should have a black sheriff. And so they campaigned for Lucius Amerson to be the sheriff of Macon County. The faculty and administration thought that's a bad idea. That will scare the white people. So they opposed Lucius Amerson's candidacy. But the students campaigned really hard and they actually were successful. So Lucius Amerson became the first black sheriff elected in the South since Reconstruction because of the Tuskegee student movement and against the faculty and administration, which just shows you the kind of political momentum is with the students in that moment. And they've actually surpassed the faculty and administration in and political think, leadership. I think this is such an important lesson as we think of folk today who would consider ourselves radicals or to the, to the left of how you use your weapon and you choose your weapon. As you say, 
generations can overflow the boundaries that previous generations had, but not if not for those generations, you would have that struggle. Because if memory serves, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian. Wasn't Dr. Gamillion one of the people who said maybe you need to slow your roll? And I think Absolutely. about that. I think about that every time I'm down in Tuskegee because, as I said, there are law students out there and lawyers and legal scholars listening to this right now who only know Charles Gamillion from Gamillion versus Lightfoot when they used the 15th Amendment to challenge the gerrymander and won at the Supreme Court. So he's a he's an untroubled hero to generations of lawyers. But now you're saying this is the same comedian It's like, hey, hold on, uh, y'all slow y'all roll. And they use the very weapon that he helped get them at this black hospital on the faculty of Tuskegee because of the compromises Robert Moton made. This is truly remarkable. I mean, what kind of lessons can we learn from this idea that, you know, each generation is contributing, but it might not look the way they had planned it when they started out to plan it. Right, and and that that pushing at the boundaries um, you know, on the student side, we would hope that they would recognize and and be able to understand the way they're standing on the shoulders of the work of previous generations, even if they find the previous generation's work insufficient, which they always do. Um, and for us now in the older generation, we have to kind of take a deep breath because uh, young people are often trying to go somewhere that we think is inappropriate or too fast. Uh, or, you know, they're not doing it the right way. And sometimes we're right, you know, <laughs> it doesn't mean we're never right or that they're always right. Um, but there is this pattern of them pushing past what we find acceptable. And, and this can change sometimes in some moments of history. This happens very rapidly. And I think in a moment of African liberation and anti-war struggle and the uh, successes of the Southern freedom movement, um, I think this this was a moment of rapid transformation that caught some people like Gamillion uh, off guard. Uh, last thing I just want to say is that one of the, you know, when you start getting obsessed with a thing, uh, you know, that experience of like you see it everywhere. Once you, I think if people read this book and start kind of going down the rabbit hole with me of Tuskegee and all of its connections politically, uh, worldwide and, and throughout social movements in the United States, you'll see that it really is, its tentacles are everywhere. And what was, one of the things that was most surprising to me was how much it shows up in the black power literature. I mean, Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton literally wrote the book for this movement. They wrote Black Power, Politics of Liberation in America. It's like the Bible of the black power movement, or at least a definitive, uh, attempting to lay down definitive ideas. And I was shocked in doing this research to see that they devoted an entire chapter to Tuskegee as the idea that Tuskegee could be a model of black power. And so I think there's a way in which Tuskegee had this place, as you say, in the black imaginary at that time that we've a little bit lost sight of, but returning to it, I think shows us um, a whole new perspective on, on the black power movement and its Southern roots. In fact, and, and correct me again if I'm wrong, but Charles Hampton spent some time on that faculty. Yeah, yeah, he taught there. Absolutely. See, we don't, you yeah. know, we don't think about, hey, we think of Columbia, and then if you think about Black Power at all, but like Manning Marable, uh, you know, mm -hmm. he, 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 he was a test on Tuskegee faculty. Now, this question of the Black University, and yeah. it's because, as you say, continental African students have been going to HBCU since the 19th century, but again, Chester Higgins and them, they're exposed to, these, to this global nature of the struggle. You write about how you put Tuskegee in a global context, as you said. What is this black university concept that these students are pushing and how successful are they? And in, in, in what, what were the limits of those possibilities as they ran up against it? Um, that's a really great question. And I think we are still grappling with that as we try to. I mean, it seems like we're in a struggle right now over black studies, not just in higher education, but in K-12. I mean, something like 17 states have passed legislation basically banning black studies. Um, so this is an ongoing struggle uh, in, and one that's far from over. We're still in this battle. But you're right. It is amazing at these historically black colleges that students would say, we need a black university and don't have it. And it's it, in part, it was at a, a moment when they felt that they everything they were learning in the struggle, they wanted to bring it to the university. Suddenly, when you're in this struggle, First of all, you're reading a lot, you're learning tremendously, you're applying things in the real world, you're having all of these epiphanies. I mean, this is an incredible intellectual awakening. Um, and then you go back to your class and it just seems so, 
It's just not where it's at. It's like, what? <laughs> like, how are you going to go back to that after this? That's and so they thought, you know what? We need to transform teaching and learning. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm doing, I'm doing the work of a historian, but doing it with the eyes of a teacher. And I'm noticing that this issue of teaching and learning keeps coming up. And they wanted to, they turn their attention from the black belt and the struggle for democracy and the elections. They turn their attention to the campus and try to transform it. And they are part of a stream that includes Howard and other HBCUs that start putting out statements saying, what we really need, all of us, is a black university. Universities dedicated to the project of social change and transformation. Um, and I think the question of whether, did they get it? No, not entirely. They didn't get everything that they wanted. But I think on Tuskegee's campus, they won quite a lot, actually. And it's pretty impressive. Absolutely. Well, when we come back, uh, Brian, when, uh, in our last segment, we're going to ask you, uh, what are the lessons we can learn from this moment in history that you've written about? And uh, I think where we're ending with this segment sets us up perfectly to explore those stories as so much of what these students wanted and their previous gen previous generations wanted remains uh, unrealized. Uh, so we'll be back in a moment here at the Black Table with Brian Jones here on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. Pull up a chair, take your seat, the Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to the Black Star Network's Black Table here. Uh, my name is Greg Carr. I'm your regular host. I'm joined by Brian Jones, author of the Tuskegee Student Movement. Remember to support the Black Star Network, download the app, tell your friends and family, and let's continue to spread this story about Black-owned Black media. So, Brian, when we left, you had set this up beautifully, man. I mean, as somebody who's been on a HBCU faculty for a couple of decades now, uh, certainly we know that the Black University remains unrealized, even at HBCUs. And you mentioned Black Studies programs. Uh, you yourself have worked in Black spaces and in multicultural spaces that are grounded in working class folk. I mean, for you grounded at the Schomburg, you know, going to City College and then working in the New York Public Library and then doing all of that with a, with a coming out of public education. You know, what lessons can we learn about how we should be thinking about education i hate to call it radical education <laughs> yeah, but yeah i mean but but what should we be learning in terms of how we move forward in this kind of attempt to 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 reimagine education well let me start where i start the book which is this moment when they are holding Tuske hundreds of tuskegee students are holding the board of trustees hostage oh yeah we didn't even talk and, about <laughs> and uh, you know that's a kind of inflammatory language uh you know, no. I think in this moment, but I want to say they, they were armed. They were armed with nothing more than documents. Oh, so they um, it's not like the uh, students at, at Cornell, the street hall. They didn't yeah. have shotguns. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. we, we talked to Abdullah Kalamata a few months ago, who, of course, was at, at, at Morehouse. And then they were taken over at Fisk. You talk about yep. the massacres at uh, South Carolina State and yep. at Southern. Yep. But Tuskegee only had documents, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they were armed with these documents and they had, you know, would, were holding the trustees hostage for this kind of marathon session of negotiating. And they and the documents were about this black university vision. So when, you know, I had these, you know, 12, 16 pages in my hand and I'm looking through them um, and reflecting on them, I think what I realized was that, oh, it's interesting. They are they reflect this kind of social justice aspiration. Like we want to take this university and make it a vehicle for broader social change in the uh, global black communities. Um, but there's also this other element there, which is trying to get the school to rise to their academic standards. Mm. Because part of what's going on in 68 is that they have frankly, being, being coming from Tuskegee, which is 
very prestigious, and by the way, still is. I mean, still a top-ranked HBCU. Uh, they have incredible career prospects. Uh, their career prospects are serious, um, and they are being, you know, uh, hunted and um, uh, what's it called, recruited, yes. um, in a very serious way. But there are many departments where the teaching level is actually too low. Uh, the engineering department being one of the biggest cases of this. I was going so to they're say taking it. radical action in some ways, not only to demand things that are related to kind of the broader project of justice, but also they're taking these radical actions of like taking over a building and holding it in order to demand higher academic standards, actually. You know, it's funny you say that because, again, we think of when we think of Tuskegee, unfortunately, too many of us grounded in that Washington Du Bois kind of almost caricatured distinction, realizing that Du Bois in Washington had kind of talked about that. And Du Bois at least tries to squash the beef after Washington dies in 1915. He came to Howard in 1930 and gave a talk mm -hmm. and work where he says, no, y'all got that wrong. <laughs> Let me walk through. But when you focus on engineering in that chapter, I was kind of surprised by that because we would think, OK, they're not going to be in the fray. But just as you talk about ROTC that Robert Moton puts in during World War One, we're not we're not doing compulsory ROTC anymore. These tensions, these intergenerational tensions show up. But then you I love the way you characterize this. You say this isn't an attempt to destroy Tuskegee by the students. In fact, quite the contrary. They have a fierce loyalty. To Tuskegee and anybody who went to an HBCU, and I went to Tennessee State, you know, we we will fight you over the HBCU, but once it's just us, we're gonna fight the HBCU. <laughs> so, I, mean, I mean, what lessons can we learn from that in terms of being having this deep fidelity to an institution, but at the same time saying, nah, we got to do something different. Yeah, I think maybe one of the lessons we can learn is not to see them just as, and, and maybe we take these lessons from HBCUs and frankly, we could apply them to many more kinds of institutions and really to all schools, but not just to see the story as being the story of a kind of single genius of the founder uh, that just plays out over time, but um, realize that they are contested spaces where faculty and students and administrators, where other people come together and push each other in different ways. And the students, I think, are to be celebrated, the student protesters. And it can be hard to embrace students whose words are so critical and so sharply critical. But I hope people can get there because if you're willing to see them that way as loyal reformers of the institution, even in their most radical moments, then I think you'll see that actually they've had an amazing effect on the school. And I, I think it also teaches us to understand part of what the student activists at Tuskegee were doing so brilliantly, which frankly might be a lesson to other student activists, is the way they spoke to these twin ambitions. Like people wanna get somewhere in this world, they wanna graduate, they wanna have some prospects after graduation, but they also want some justice along the way. Like they want things to be right and they want wrongs to be righted. And the Tuskegee student movement blended those ambitions under the banner of black power. and. Uh, what I'm arguing is that the real meaning of a black university was the marriage of those ambitions. And because they were able to wield that so effectively and bring in those different um, goals of and aspirations of students, that's why they had hundreds of students participating. That's why they shut the school down. Um, and that's why they were so successful in resting changes on campus. And even though, as and many people may not know this, so just to say, you know, the the Alabama National Guard invaded the campus, basically, and the administration shut the school down for two weeks. They dismissed everybody and said, you're no longer a student here. You have to reapply uh, in order to uh, try to weed out the, the instigators. Um, but the reality, so that had never happened before in Tuskegee's history. I mean, it's a really explosive moment that we often don't learn about. But I think the, the headline is that in the end, even though that, that, action, those actions by the Alabama National Guard and the administration kind of um, uh, deflected the energy of the movement in the in the semesters to come, they ended up succeeding. Um, and they won, uh, you know, tremendous victories, as you said, the African studies, democratization of student and faculty governance, uh, higher academic standards, uh, scholarships for athletes, 
partial abolition of mandatory ROTC and on and on and on. Um, so it was a very successful movement. I don't want to start a beef, but it might have even been more successful just pound for pound victories that they racked up than the, the struggle at the same time at Howard. Oh, no, without a doubt. I mean, yeah, I don't even think there's any question about it, which is another reason this book is so important. Um, those blended those blended objectives. You know, up until now, I think my favorite HBCU motto is Clark Atlanta. I'll find a way or make one. And we know Howard's Veritas at Utilitize. Kelly Miller's almost trying to squash a beef between Washington and, and Du Bois, pulling from Harvard and Tuskegee in the motto. But what you just said, prospects and justice. Well, listen, mm. HBCU, somebody needs <laughs> to put that <laughs> motto in. Claim all of this in a struggle. We have this contemporary struggle against this neoliberal model of education. And as you said, Kiyanga Yamada Taylor was on Harris campus about a month ago and we were, we were on a panel together and, she, and we talked about the fact that there is no sheltered rear. As you say, whether it's K-12, education, you know, as we, we're looking at a society where education seems more and more being placed in the hands of the profiteers, it, in some ways looking almost more closer to the 19th century <laughs> than any time before, any, any final thoughts on the lessons that we can take from this moment. And I love the way, by the way, that you integrate something that you were writing up until this moment, the <laughs> protests at Howard and other places that took place during, you know, in the wake of COVID. Any mm -hmm. lesson that we should be taking from uh, this, this, this case study in terms of how we attack this neoliberal concept of education? Well, I think the one thing is that the students and parents and faculty, uh, of course, are crucial to the struggle, understanding that these are these institutions are contested spaces. Um, I think using some of the wisdom of the Tuskegee movement and making sure that we're speaking to people's, uh, you know, ambitions for uh, success on the terms of the institution and the institution's uh, uh, terms of its own success and broader questions of justice that are of course shot through with all of these institutions. But I also think that there was a moment where some people were beginning to think that like black studies was co-opted and you know, uh, and that the struggle for black studies was over. And I think it's clear that that's not true. Um, and that not just black studies, but black history remains uh, something that we have to fight for and make space for. Um, in all kinds of educational spaces. And it's remarkable to me that even at a historically black college, students were making that same argument. Um, you know, at the uh, Arturo Schomburg, who founded the Schomburg Center, is an Afro-Puerto Afro Rican uh, activist and bibliophile and archivist. Uh, you know, his teacher in Puerto Rico, uh, his elementary school teacher, uh, according to the probably ap apocryphal story, told him that there was no such thing as black history when he raised his hand and asked for it. And here we are at the 21st century where students basically ask the same questions. Like, when are we gonna learn? When are we gonna have some time to really do uh, some black history in our school? And we still have to fight for that space. So I take a lot of inspiration from this book and the activists profiled in it and, um, I think we have some resources for the next round of struggle. No question. And in fact, um, in, in being from Nashville, Tennessee, I'm embarrassed to say it took me going to graduate school to realize that Arturo Schomburg spent time on on the staff at at Fisk. I mean that that so we talk about Black Brown Unity. You know this Afro Latino. He was at Fisk University. But I mean, and I know we're we're right up against the clock. But I have to ask you, being director of the New York Public Library Center for Education and Schools. You're doing some of that work. Could you tell us briefly, I mean, and then we'll have to have you back, not only what you're doing there and how that connects to this conversation we're having, but how folk can reach out to you to perhaps connect to that work. Yeah, they can um, They can email me, Jones at nypl.org is the simplest way. But essentially, um, I'm trying in this new role to build on the work I was doing at the Schomburg Center, which was to make the Schomburg Center's resources easily accessible and available for educators. Uh, it's one thing for researchers to go and, you know, find amazing things in the archives and bring them out in books. Um, but there's some things in those archives that really everybody should see and they should be in every classroom. And so that was the work I started at the Schomburg Center. And now I'm uh, taking on for the whole of the New York Public Library, which is, I think, the nation's largest uh, public, it is the nation's largest public library system, but I think it's also the nation's largest public research library network. 
Um, so we're very excited that the library has taken on this work and it's really about supporting teachers and schools. So if you're a teacher out there who's interested in using the resources of the New York Public Library, reach out to me. That is my job is to get all of these rich resources into your hands and, and into your students' hands. Well, thank you, man. This is, uh, and you all, please take uh, Dr. Jones up on that invitation because he's there. That's what he's there for. And then I'll, cer I'll certainly look forward to uh, coming up 95 and spending some time with you down there, man. I mean, it, 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 yes. So it, it, it's a real honor. And uh, shout out to Dean Phillips. Thank you for <laughs> to him for connecting us. And uh, Robert, I mean, Rob, I'm talking about your daddy's name. I'm thinking about your dad. <laughs> <laughs> your foster fam, everybody. Uh, Brian Jones, thank you for this gift of, of a text and for the comradeship of your struggle and uh, shoulder to shoulder, victory is assured, brother. So thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate you too, brother. So we're going to clear the table and get ready for our next uh, segment of the Black Table next week. So back in a moment. Put ten in here, ten, and you don't come out till you die. And you eat him, you eat him, eat him. Oh you my God. Oh. Oh. Back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Remember to support the Black Star Network in every way. Uh, I'm Greg Carr, your regular host. We've spent the last hour with Dr. Brian P. Jones, author of the Tuskegee Student Movement, and we're going to close with words from him from the conclusion of his book. He says the Tuskegee Student Movement is a small part of the long Black freedom struggle, the battles of which have frequently taken place in and for school. That experience of collective action, too, becomes a kind of school. In that school, students frequently become teachers and teachers become students. Its lessons belong to the future actors who step onto the stage of history and dare to speak. That will be us. So let's take a, a page from Dr. Brian Jones and continue this struggle as we inherit the lessons from the past and make them relevant today and for the living future. See you next week. Thank you.